Hi, everybody. My name is Danica Joan, and welcome to Custody Matters Live. My two very special guests are Don Andrea McCarty and Caroline Rena. They are two of my our conference planning committee team members and invaluable uh, friends. And uh, so, welcome, welcome to the show. Thank, Thank you. you, Danica. Thanks. So, one of the reasons that I brought you two ladies onto the show this time is just to have a conversation about what's important to us, and and also to kind of I know that you've created a uh, a Facebook page. Uh, together in collaboration and, and that's something I want to shine the light on because when people see what you're up to they get to they get to see this whole community that we've created um, for you know for the best interest of parents and and children just families because we're all committed to bringing healing to hurting families right mm -hmm. yes uh, right. so who, who would like to get started tell, tell us a little bit about who you are um, what you're up to, and then we'll get into sharing the, the Facebook page. Go ahead, Don. <laughs> <laughs> you want to <dress> Ross? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I am Don McCarty, and I am helping with this, uh, with our uh, Guardians and Gatekeepers conference, virtual conference now coming up in April, and we are busy just trying to you know how they say pay it forward we're we're paving it forward we're laying some groundwork on how we can um, bring the conference speakers to our viewers still even though we're all stuck in our own little worlds and our own little square boxes here <laughs> but you know that, that doesn't mean that we can't still deliver the powerful messages that we have so we are working on um, some great topics and great speakers to come and join us and we have also created, um, Caroline and I have created what's called Silent Voices, and it's just more of that paving it forward where we can help people come in and, and share in their healing processes, because we've all been through some type of trauma in our, in our lifetimes. You know, some of us are parents, some of us are children, some of us have just lived a lifetime and not really knowing or understanding some of the things that have happened to us, so we're here to help um, help people understand what may have happened to them so that they can go through a process of healing and seeing that it actually can be done. And it's actually, you know, it, it, it takes work, but it's not hard. And we can, um, we can overcome a lot of things and be our whole self in, in a holistic way. So for, I'll stop there and I'll let someone yeah, else. Yeah, you know, uh, something I wanted to put in, and, and it's obvious there's three women here, and a lot of times in our circle of influence with family advocacy work, um, we are, we've said many, many times that this is not a gender conversation, that we're not pro-mom and anti-dad, we're actually um, very okay. balanced. In fact, my organization that I created is called Kids Need Both, and it was, it's interesting that I've actually partnered with a lot of fathers groups. Um, mm -hmm. And I've done that because a lot of times, a lot of different groups will, uh, because they've been injured by the other, the other gender. Um, right. And I know with our, in our case, I know my case and Caroline's case, um, we were the ones that were the targeted parents. And mm -hmm. Dawn, you were, you're a, an adult child of alienation. So yeah, and it was my father that was targeted in that situation. So yeah, so we we get that it's just really about being human and humanity and uh, the importance of children having. I know you as an adult child, you get the importance of what it would what would have been made the difference to have an unencumbered oh. relationship with both parents. Yeah, having both, and you know, and and I've said it a couple of times. I've recently posted that. I'm at war with a monster. I'm not at war with a gender. It, it doesn't matter if it's a mom or a dad. I'm, I'm out there fighting and I'm fighting for both of them. I'm fighting against the monsters. Yeah. And it's really, and this kind of brings into with Caroline, Carolina, Caroline and I really relate on a very spiritual level of, and, 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 Dawn as well, but when I first got to know Caroline, I realized I, I met my hippie sister. <laughs> and uh, first and time all... you've ever said that. <laughs> <laughs> hey. It's, it's just, you know, just love. And, and I get that love conquers hate. 
love conquers fear. And, um, and if we can focus on unity and unification versus separation, and it's not us versus them, and yet we get that in the courts, it is us versus them, and who, who wins? You know, you know um, thank you for bringing that up, Danica. Um, I'm Caroline Rena, and um, Danica and I, I reached out to Danica, I think it was like two years ago at this point, or a little longer, because I really, really, really wanted to get involved with um, Bubbles of Love. Do you remember that, Danica? And I, I was trying to find whoever the person was that was doing it, because I couldn't find it. <laughs> and honestly, I still haven't been to one of those events yet. <laughs> Um, but, but it was interesting because in my process and everything that I, that I went through with my kids for the last 20 years, we, we were on the same path, but really didn't converge until about two years ago. Um, and what's interesting is that, um, you know, I hear what you say, Don, about the, the fighting, but, um, what I have also noticed, and I don't mean to negate what you're saying. It's like, when you fight you're you're coming from a space of anger when you love you're coming from a space of peace so even on my website i put i put um something to the effect of uh you can't you can't um have a, a balanced like you were saying you can't have a balanced result if you're coming in from a space mm -hmm. of fear or anger yeah. or fighting yep. or whatever you need to come in from love in order right. to create love on the outside of you. And it's all starting here. And that's where, you know, the, everything that's going on right now, whether it's with, you know, parental alienation, with the virus, whether, you know, the whole world is just showing its underbelly right now in how much fear there is in people and how much um, trauma there is in people all the way from, you know, the, the president of the United States to, um, I heard, and I don't know if this is true or not because I didn't research it, but you know, like one of the one of the um, leaders of of Germany uh, committed suicide because this the whole virus thing was getting to getting so much to him. It's that. like all this stuff that's coming up. If there's love, that that kind of stuff doesn't happen. Well, and, and I want to I want to um, continue what you're saying there. That you know, figuratively, we're we're in a fight, right? We're 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 coming together. And in order for us to, to work together, we do have to start loving each other more in order for us to conquer this, um, this event, these events that are happening to us. So if we come as fragmented shards at this, we're never going to break through. We have to come through it together to make an impact. And the best place to make an impact is in the vulnerable spots. But if we're all spread out and we're all trying to come at different angles, we're never going to break through. So figuratively, we're fighting, but we have to fight with the armor of love and, mm -hmm. and yep. unity. Spiritual warriors. <laughs> yes. yes. Uh, so, so yesterday at our weekly um, conference planning team meeting, and, and so it's been an amazing evolution, actually. It went from a physical conference, April 24th and 25th, to, uh-oh, we can't do it physically. And then we were like, okay, well, we're committed that, that families need what we have to offer, and we, um, and this has to happen. So we shifted it to an online conference. Uh, platform, but then we then ideas started coming up, and we're like, wait a minute, this does not need to be a one-time thing event. Like where you come, you get your information, and then um, and then all the information sort of fades. And it's away. done, You're right? Mm -hmm. So we decided we started brainstorming. We said, we you know, and plus a conference, we were actually having to turn away uh, prospective speakers because. There was only so much we could squeeze in to an eight hour day. So that's when we started saying, well, why does it have to be a one time one shot conference? Why can't we create an, a repository of information, much like maybe a TED talk where um, it's all curated by topics and um, maybe even a series or repeat, you know, or continuations of yeah, and I know we're doing this even like here on Custody Matters Live. It is uh, something that we, we broadcast on Facebook Live and on the different social media, but it's still 
something that's like a, a stream. I call it a, um, when a leaf lands on the stream, it just goes and goes and goes, and it's very difficult to, to recapture that leaf um, unless we put a structure in place. And having a platform where people can actually search or the speakers and the topics that they want that would make a difference in their lives. What's really great is we've always been committed to um, educating the parents because if the parents come in educated on what they're going through, just like with me, that was the first thing I did. 2001, I educated my, I'm like, my kids are acting like aliens. They, they treat me like I'm the enemy. What's going on? And I researched, researched, researched. And at that time, you really did have to research um, it wasn't find like, anything at that time. I was in that same space. I get it. I get it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's when I stumbled across Dr. Richard, Richard Warshock and oh my gosh, in his book, Divorce Poison. And it was, it was my survival, my field guide for surviving mm -hmm. parental alienation. And that was my mission from that point forward is making it easier for other parents who are going through that curating information um, and stuff like that. So this is just a continuation of what's, what's uh, needed to happen is um, providing information, not just for parents, but and also I, the experts, the experts. Yeah, and, that, and I'd like to add to that too, because, you know, back 20 years ago, same thing, you know, I could not find anything online. I didn't, I, it was told to me, the words parental alienation were told to me by my ex-husband, his ex-wife and the kids therapist that we all came together which was a total you know anyway she's like pulled me aside and she said you know what this is it's parental alienation told me that and then when I went back to her to try to get more information she's like I never told you that so I started going online and the only thing that I could find finally after I think it took me about a year after that before I could find anything Sarvi Emo was the one who started um the par parental alienation Parental Alienation Awareness Organization and the Bubbles of Love. I found her at the very beginning and we sat on the phone for, God, probably almost three hours talking and that was my lifeline back um, because I kept, I knew there was something wrong and I'm sure you experienced this too, Danica. There's something wrong. I don't know what it is. I want to figure it out. I can't figure it out. And it was like this whole woo thing going on. And when I connected with her, it was like, aha, and me being the researcher that I am, led me into healing and doing similarly um you you picked up dr warshock's work warshack um and i just started picking up anything i could find self-help and you know spiritual and native american da, 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 da. that's how i ended up starting on my healing journey and just pulling it in everything i could get in to heal and heal and heal and because i knew that there was a better way to handle what was happening to me with me inside of me and in, in my you know, external world. Yeah. And believe me, it is not an easy journey, but it is definitely worth it. Right. Well, and you know, what's interesting is kids do not have those resources either. Uh -uh. So the adult children can't go online and say, what was it called? You know, right. what, what happened to, you know, my mom and dad got a divorce. What happened to me? There's, there's no known name that's just readily available. And so if like, for me, it took me over a year to really figure out what happened because i i can read everybody's posts i can say well yeah that that fits well okay this is a better fit so it just was such a long process to figure out what really happens so that's what's nice about this is it can be all in one one place and it's mm -hmm. all of our voices so a parent could be listening to you and i or you and I, you know, all three of us or a child could be listening to all three of us and they can get some information out of it and it's, then they're not silent anymore. Yeah. Right. Sorry, I'm glad you said that. I picked that up. I was like, yeah, we're not silent anymore. <laughs> you know, as an educator in the school system, what I discovered in becoming a school teacher is there was this whole collaborative environment of lesson plans and resources and things like that, where I could literally now all these teachers are having to shift from an in classroom to online. And it, I know it's probably mind blowing for them to shift that structure, but I'll tell you, teachers are greatly supported with resources and lesson plans and stuff like that. And that's what I wanted this to also provide experts and or professionals. Mm -hmm. 
the mental health counselors that find themselves having to figure out how they're going to, to deal with a parent and a child and reconnect them. They, if we can provide them resources, we can provide the resources to the attorneys and um, mental health counselors and the educators, um, that, that's just going to make everything better. Yeah. Um, so we are, we're here to provide resources for anybody that might be involved in this particular area. Or, or just trauma. Well, I mean, trauma is well, part trauma. of, are you talking about silent voices or are you talking about the I'm whole, talking about what Danica is saying, thing, what you, gotcha. you know, what you okay. bring to it, what I bring to it, yeah. what we put into our conference, what we're putting into silent voices, all right. of that. And the repository or the conference, um, what we're turning it into the platform yeah. is mm -hmm. a great place for a lot of this to live. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the key is to live, to not just be there momentarily. It's going to be there and constantly added to and curated. And it's, it's important to say that it's curated and vetted because as we've been in this uh, advocacy work for many, many, many years, and we've seen people come and go. We've mm -hmm. seen people get lots of attention and then it's sort of, and they sort of fizzle out and we've, and you know, um, sometimes, and people go through good spaces and, and, and dark spaces in their own lives. And we've seen this definitely where, um, there's, there is a certain aspect of, um, parental alienation advocacy where there's people who are very negative and they're not really helping, uh, people to heal because they're so broken themselves. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's really important that, that in this platform that we make sure that it's going to make make somebody's life better not just make them militant or 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 whatever um giving them tools giving them resources and educating is i think a, a big a big asset to when you can community. when you can heal yourself then you can reach out and connect with other people you can become an advocate you know i mean like you said, Danica, I mean, two years ago, I was in isolation myself working through my own stuff. And um, once I came out of that and I, you know, I met my, my partner, my singing partner, Noel and partner Noel, um, <laughs> he'll kill me if I say that. Um, I just re recognized how much closer, I mean, it wasn't until after that happened that we started connecting. It's like, it's like, you know, I've been wanting to do this for so long and I kept going, diving in, doing the work, healing work and all that stuff. And then I come back out and I'm like, now what am I supposed to do? You know, and little by little by little, it's interesting because the healing process, the journey of healing actually leads us to our, um, exactly. uh, well, what's the, everybody's looking for their reason for being here. Your purpose. The, the purpose. And you know, yeah. And, and I like it what leads, it's a guidance system that, you know, you, you mm -hmm. rid of, you, you, disperse the negative energy, whatever it is, you integrate it, and then you step into yep. the next level, you step into the next level, and then you connect. That's how it works. It's all mm -hmm. starts here in your own so Something I was working on was, you know, people look at something as, you know, that door just closed. And sometimes we're stuck on, I want that door to be open. So I'm going to sit, I'm going to try and keep opening this door because th that's where I think I need to be. <laughs> the problem is, is that there's a door that's wide open behind you, but you're right. not looking. So we always have to be looking for those open doors and not continuing to go back to a closed door. And that's moving forward and trying to move into another space. Right. And that space provides different lessons and different answers and different opportunities for either yourself growing or helping someone else grow. And those doors actually close for a reason sometimes. You know, something I've noticed is a lot of times we get into relationship with someone. So you've had a traumatic experience. Maybe it was your childhood. Maybe you came from abuse or neglect. So then you get bonded with someone based on like an, an exclusive conversation of what was bad about your past. Um, a lot of times we get into these unhealthy relationships uh, that end up in parental alienation um, that we actually were very bonded through through the trauma and through this um, and and I guess the reason I bring that up is that 
it is very important that we don't get stuck in that conversation um, of constantly talking about um, the trauma because when you eliminate that from the conversation, what do you have in common? What can you talk about that's positive and productive? Yeah. And if and don't, you, don't, you can't say that there's anything really like, wow, there's nothing to talk about now. Yeah. You really have to question how healthy your relationship is being, is developing and you need to really start bringing in the good stuff into yeah. a friendship. And I'm not talking, you know, I'm talking about any conversation, whether it's with your sister or your friend or your um, romantic partner, the yeah. conversations should never constantly focus on the evil ex, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, all the disempowering conversations. That's interesting so you brought but, that up, Danica, because the, one of the videos that we sent you is about relationships and how you can, what you bring into a relationship, how you maneuver through yourself and the, and the partnership with the other person, no matter who they are yeah. in a relationship. So yeah. and what's important too, is that a lot of times, like continuing what you said is we get so comfortable or so familiar with an environment that, you know, we don't want it to change or we're so used to, used to that bond or we're comfortable with that bond, even though it may not be what's best for us. So understanding when to, you know, the, they, they say that familiarity breeds contempt. And sometimes you're so fixated on that familiarity that you're not realizing that you're living in contempt. Can I and that there's, something? yeah, I just like to, that, that's very important because it's not even, it's not the contempt of the other person no. that shows up. It's your own no. contempt and your own self judgment of yourself that shows up that you mirror in the other person and they're going to show up the way they show up to show you what you're doing in order to heal. And that's huge. And that's huge for me. And it's been that way in the last, um, couple of weeks that I've been going through that, that mirroring thing and, and, and recognizing that piece. Because when we, when we look at like, yeah, we've got all these things going on, but is it really necessarily that person or am I doing something or contributing or is what my behavior off or what's happening here? That's yeah, that's a lesson that we're not taught. I wasn't right. taught that. And right. so I wasn't good at understanding what I needed to do, what I, who I needed to be in my own marriage or in my own relationships. Right. So I can't blame anybody else for what some of the things that happened because right. I didn't understand it myself. Right. So that's what we're, that's what we're bringing. That's mm -hmm. what we're. So speaking of that, I'm going to share the screen so I can share um, a page or a section of your, your uh, Facebook page. Let's see. Can everybody see this? Don't forget your worth. Stand up for yourself. You matter. I like that quote. This, your Facebook page is called Silent Voices. Actually, the whole, the Facebook thing is called Silent Voices for the Children. I love that. So share with us a little bit about that. Go ahead, Caroline. Okay. <laughs> you get through that. I was waiting for you to do that. So um, basically, uh, we came in together from different aspects of the um of well, different stories and however we came also came in together don and i from the same same feelings and that's usually what we what we end up with um when we're with somebody and that's how we can be empathetic with somebody is because we have the same feelings we all go through shame we've all been through um anger have anger feelings we all have fear we all have happiness we all have sadness and and in order to recognize this stuff and bring bring it together um it's just our intention is to connect with grandparents parents fathers and mothers um siblings uh aunts and uncles all of these people are being separated our, our lives are being separated from our children and each other based on the way I see it on, um, anger on um, when, when two people get divorced, they're angry. And what's the, what do you want to do when you want to, when you're angry with somebody, you want to hurt them before they hurt you. And so people don't know how to control that when they're in that anger moment. And so coming together with Dawn and talking about this and bringing it out, like there's another thing happening here. It's not just, I'm angry at 
your father, or I'm angry at your mother or whatever. It's also, I'm wounded and I'm bringing this to the relationship and that's why I'm angry. And so that affects the children because especially, you know, when they're younger, they can pick up, even when they get older, energetically, kids can pick up. They don't even have to see or listen to what's happening. Energetically, they can pick up anger and, and all this stuff and they immediately go into shame immediately they don't know what to do they don't have the resources to deal with shame so they go into shame and they're always going to listen to the parent that is with them because that's their you know that's their world that's that's what they know and so um bringing silent voices in those children they can't speak for themselves they can't heal them they can't do anything for themselves and it's our responsibility as parents as mothers as fathers as grandparents as aunts as uncles whoever you are to heal that in yourself in order to be a safe space for your children because if you don't do that mm -hmm. they're gonna feel that from you it doesn't matter how you can put this big old smile on your face i'm sure you've dealt dealt with this with other people you can put this big old smile on your face and somebody can still see your energy or feel your energy and they know you're not a safe person to come to and the kids yeah. are going to so the goal for parents is how can we and i and i've mentioned this before how can we prepare you to receive your child or your children so by working through some of these things helping people work on themselves and being more self-aware will help you prepare for that day that your child comes knocking on your door or making the phone call. And we want to get you from that phone call to having, you know, lunch or maybe invited over for dinner and then maybe Christmas. And then, you know, it, it should continue. We don't want to see that reuni reunification, the one time reunification. We want it to be multiple and ongoing for the rest of your lives. We want it to be permanent. We want it to be back to where it should be as far as your relationship and your bond with your parents and your children. So what I'm seeing from your uh, Facebook page, and I'm looking uh, at some of the posts and stuff like that, what I'm seeing is that you're really giving people support and strategies on how they can bring healing to themselves. Yeah. Yes. It's not about the fight. It's about the heal. Yeah. That's really what it is. I mean, when you think about it, a lot of times us, me including, included there's a reason why um it, it it's not like i um when you're attracted to a malignant narcissist you don't just say wow i really want to find a narcissist to follow right. you there's something there's like a magnet that has you attracted to them and in my case i was very much a codependent not knowing what even codependency was mm -hmm. but basically it was I had a need to be needed. I, I found my importance in being used up by, uh, and, and it, so it makes a perfect match for a malignant narcissist who wants to suck up everything that you, every part of you. So yeah. is it, so do you blame the malignant narcissist or do you say, you know, or you take ownership and say, you know what, there's something about me that I was, in was like in my blind spot about me that I need to really work on in healing myself from that. So Girl, I don't self awareness. Have another one. Yeah. Right. A hundred percent. It it's definitely it, it it's always in us because that's just how physiology, humanry, whatever you want to call it, that's just how this works. I mean we're raised as children from zero to six we're like sponges. And we take in whatever is going on in our environment because we don't know what else to do. And so when that locks into our system, that's how we run our, that's how our lives are run off of that baseline um, understanding of what we've seen in, in, with our parents, with our school, you know, going to school, whatever, whatever happened to us. If you were bullied your entire childhood, what do you think you're going to do? You're going to find someone, oh, 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 please, please love me, please love me. And that narcissist will come and please love you for the first, you know, year or whatever that is. And then, but the narcissist, oddly enough, the narcissist went through the same thing. So he, that person is also traumatized, which is why they are a narcissist to begin yeah. to begin with. So that's another, you know, layer. Of yeah. One of my, one of our team members, our planning team members, she has, her son is autistic and, um, and she shared this amazing document 
and it and it had something to do with autism but really what spoke to me was the definition of a malignant or toxic narcissist and their characteristics and they talked about that they said they said how do they become that way there a lot of times there's a withhold of emotional um the things that they needed as a child they mm -hmm. didn't have maybe um you know dad was taken out of their life so they didn't have father in their life mother was uh, a toxic narcissist who had no love to give to this parent to this child and then the predictable outcome is this child grows up um, needing to suck up the energies of a good um you know codependent person but the, and that's what they wanted they've always wanted the person that they meet deep down inside their little boy or girl that's what they want they know they want that but they don't know how they don't think that they're going to get it so they pull it that's where the the pulling comes from and the sucking out of the energy of the person who do you understand what i'm saying when i when i say that it's like it that's so interesting that you said that i just i just even thought about that it's it's they're so desperate to be loved that they will do anything to get that love, including beat somebody down, literally figure whatever, whatever is going on. And um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's huge. That's really important to understand about narcissists because, you know, even as a, as a, a alienated parent, we can be narcissistic too, because we're being, we're being put in that same place. You know, nobody, you don't love me. Why don't you love me? Why are you walking away? Because new relationships are going to bring that out. And um, it, it's not easy to maneuver that, but being able to observe what's happening and, and um, making yourself aware of what's happening in your own, you know, psyche, your own body, you know, cause you'll feel these things too. It's, you'll, you'll see it and you can empathize. You may not like it, but you can empathize with the person who's, who did that to you. I tell you, when, when Anne um, shared this article, it just like, just like a light bulb went off. I mean, and, and I've had a lot of peace with my past for a very long time, but it just brought so much up for me that it's like, oh, now I understand why my ex um, turned out the way that he did. And, um, and it doesn't, and I've long since been able to let go of the, the, the hate and the bitterness and stuff like that, but I can have compassion, I right? Have compassion for wh why he, how he turned out the way he turned out. And, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm there as well because it's, it's very important to be able to empathize because every, like I said, everybody has the same feelings. Everybody's had a trauma, whether it's a mini trauma or a macro trauma. And um, everybody's been through something. I don't think that there's a person on the planet at this time <laughs> that has not. I could be wrong. Um, but I really believe that the more we can, we can see that in ourselves and see that pain. I mean, I'd like to share, if you don't mind, just a really quick about my mother. You've heard the story before about how I was able to forgive my mother. Both of you, I think, have heard this. If you don't mind my sharing that, that kind of gives them, might give an example Yes. Of, um, yeah. Okay. So my mother, I did not have a relationship with my mother at all. Uh, she left, actually my father gave her $2,500 to leave my life when I was 12. But prior to that, she was very bipolar, narcissistic herself. Didn't know how she was never taught how to be a mother. So I never learned that from her. And, um, so I held, um, with everything that was, um, emotionally, uh, happened with me with her and well, I'm going to talk about her for now. Um, and everything, not physically, I wasn't physically abused that way. It was more like, a um, uh, not being, she didn't pay attention to me. She didn't know how to nurture me, that type of thing. So I built anger, 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 my entire life. And I could never understand it. And then I finally, when I was in my early forties, I reconnected with her. And, um, I remember she, she was screaming at me on the phone saying things like, um, why haven't you called me? Why haven't you, you know, checked in on me? You know, and this is like 30 years later or whatever it is. And I'm listening to this and I'm like, wow, this sounds vaguely familiar. And then I, I happened to have the, the court paperwork from when I was a kid, when my parents got divorced. And it said in there that she used to say that to me when I was four. So that triggered me to 
I got really upset. I hung the phone up on her and I didn't talk to her for 10 years. I think it was something like that. And so I want to, I'm going to throw something in here. That piece of it, what the trigger of the inner of the child, that little four year old girl who heard that remembered it when that came up again and it re triggered me at the time. And it, it forced me into, Oh my God, there's more here that I've got to do. But it, you know, logically I knew that on the other side, I didn't, I just hung up. It's the first time I've ever done that. I yelled at her. I'm like, I can't talk. <laughs> and I hung up on her and, and that was it. So four years ago, I started doing personal, really heavy duty personal development work. And I was working on forgive, forgiveness work with my mother. And, um, when I, when I did that, it was not, trust me at the beginning, it was not easy to do that because I didn't, at first I didn't even understand that I needed to forgive myself as well. That's a whole nother explanation, a whole nother informational thing, but I could not forgive her. However, I made the decision to forgive her. And as I was doing it, I started coming across a bunch of paperwork from her that I, that I had found and understanding who she was as a child, which she went through. She was a second generation Holocaust survivor. She escaped uh, Czechoslovakia to go to Israel when she was four years old. I don't know what happened in any of that stuff because it was never told, but I can only imagine during World War II. Um, so she was very, very, very traumatized. And so I went through the healing process with her forgiveness, you know, thinking of her as a little four-year-old who went, who had all the, these things happen to her and I can forgive the four-year-old. So it was the same person though, energetically, you're still forgiving that person. And I forgave the four-year-old. And then a couple of years later, she got sick. She was living in New Mexico. She got sick. Um, I went to her after having done that work with her. And I went into her room and um, it, I remembered her as being this like monster. She's five foot three. She was, or five foot two when she was alive. This monstrous person above me. And that's only two inches shorter than me, right? So she's this thing. That's how I see my mother. I go in there and um, I went into her room. She ended up being going into hospice for a while. It was about two years. And I sat in there with her and just... I didn't even hardly talk to her. I just gave her learn, the learned things I call, they called it A's to B's. It's like giving and receiving love through the eyes. She couldn't handle it. It was, it was the weirdest thing. She's like, what are you doing? I don't know what you're doing. I don't like that. And then once I left there or before I left there, I cried because I was getting after three hours, we had this great um, connection, which is what I'd always wanted to do. And I cried. I had one single tear coming down my face and she wiped that tear off of my face after that three hours. And I was like totally blown away from that. And being able to heal that, I did it for her generationally. I, I did that for myself, but it also helped her generationally. And it was important for me to do that because, um, it's like being able to connect with that. That's why, you know, Dawn, I talk to you about inner child work all the time. That's why it's so important to me because I know how healing um, that is to be able to, you know, forgive somebody. It's, well, it's done for ourselves. It's not for other people. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. What people don't know is um, it, a lot of people feel like um, they, they don't understand that they need to reflect and look within and look at that self-awareness. And there's a lot of taboo about admitting that or being weak or, you know, cause we, we grew up in a society in a lot of ways that we were, you know, toughen up or, you know, so what we want to show is exactly what she did with her mom is that there's, there's quite simple steps to take that are, they, they don't cost money. It's free. It's healing. It's rewarding. There's things that every single person can work on without having to humiliate yourself with it. There's no humiliation in this. There is no, um, there, there's no shame in this. We all have differences in our suffering, what we've gone through in our traumas. So nobody knows what you're healing. They just know that you are. And that's the important part. Mm -hmm. And we're out of time. Oops. Okay. <laughs> and that happened. Yeah. I'm like the bad guy. We're out of time. Um, so, all right, I'm going to share it one more time. 
the the page it is um it is silent voices it's a facebook page and it is silent voices for the children uh just remember silent voices for their children because there are several actually a few of um uh, facebook pages with that name and here's the about that um you can look at more just to be familiar with it but um thank you yeah we joining me it's been a great conversation um and i'm just i'm loving what you're creating uh to help people through their journey to sort out all those things all those hidden things that are um in the recesses of their mind that have um that were they're not even aware are, and when Caroline and I learn from each other, so that's the kind of cool thing about it is. That's know, we, very true. <laughs> <laughs> we learn from each that's other. That's relationship though. You just said it <laughs> in a nutshell. We learn from each other. All right. So, well, thank you so much for joining us for Custody Matters Live. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. See you again next week. Thank you. Mm -hmm.